Okay, I'll hand over to you half of it. Okay, um, so this is a a follow-on from largely from James Pallister's talk uh, an hour or so ago, um, and we're going to cover a, some work we're just starting, um, looking at how we can use milepost type technology, um, but with the objective of uh, generating uh, energy efficient uh, code. Um, some of you may notice a theme about how I work at these conferences that I tend to come along and tell you about what we're going to do and then send my staff along the next year to tell you what they actually did. Um, so we're actually going to partly do that already this year because I'm going to do the first introductory bit where I explain what the problem is and Simon here will then take over and talk a bit about how we're starting to try and solve the problem and this is designed to be an interactive session so once what we're looking for at this stage is a lot of input from you guys about how we might go forward over this project so what what's it all about well Today, if you look at all the optimizations in GCC, they're written either to optimize for speed or to optimize for space or possibly both. And the question asked is what if we could optimize for energy usage? And if you, those of you who go to electronics conferences will notice the common topic on any electronics design conference is how can you reduce energy? Um, and the sort of things we look are at the small end, the deeply embedded end. Um, so, well, the top end of that would be mobile phones. How do you make the battery last longer? The bottom end is how do you get more power out of your energy scavenging device or your long lifetime meter that's going for 15 years on a single dry cell? Um, so, let's explain where we've come from. We've come from two strands of academic research. The first is research into energy usage by hardware and software. And I think one of the key things we're bringing here is it's not just about the hardware we're looking at. On the whole, modern silicon design is very good when it comes to energy efficiency. Dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, uh, clock gating, that sort of thing are fabulously efficient. We're looking at the software as well. There's been less work done on actually trying to make sure the software then doesn't piss away all your energy savings. The um, work that's been done to date has largely been based on modelling. So there are a number of academically respected models of energy usage in silicon chips. The challenge we have with those is even on their own admission, they're only about accurate to within 10%. And when you're starting to look at individual optimizations that may save only 1 or 2%, that's not accurate enough. So that was the original mo mo motivation behind James Pallister's project last summer, was actually to get some hard data of what is the impact of compiler optimizations on actual energy, and to do it by physically measuring. The second strand of research is that we're picking up is the work on actually feeding back information into the compiled process. So you think of things like uh, feedback directed optimizations, F profile generate, F profile use, and then moving on the, pro the milepost project using machine learning to start to learn and feed back what are the most effective optimizations. So those are the two strands of work that we're pulling together, but focusing on energy. The third thing that comes in is the UK government's Technology Strategy Board, which is the UK innovation agency, and it spends several hundred million each year supporting industrial uh, research. And they've had an initiative over the last year to fund research into energy efficient computing, and we've jointly with Bristol University won one of those grants and that's given us the level of funding to support us as a small company to do this research. It doesn't fully pay for it, we're putting some of our own dollar in, but it gives us enough that we can actually justify doing this research. 
and that gives us the Magic project machine guided energy efficient computing and it kicked off about six weeks ago the slides will be published I'm not going to talk through this slide if you want to find out more these four are all review papers um, to some extent so you can go to them and then find all the back research from them but you'll, I'm not going to talk to them you can look them up on the slides um, <coughs> so let's just draw together what the new things are about this project the first is that it is focused on energy optimization and what we're looking at is trying to get to the stage where today's programs running on today's hardware work using 20 to 40 percent less energy <coughs> the second thing is that we are working in the real world we're not going to model the energy usage we're actually going to physically measure it and just to divert slightly um, you saw the first generation of the energy measurement uh, from James earlier the new board um, which uh, we're <coughs> working on at the moment and just bringing up is a much much higher performance sampler so it samples six million voltage samples a second um, it has uh, an, uh, a decent arm board to do some onboard processing and then stream the data off um, it can actually process samples faster than it can stream them so we can do short bursts at six uh, a million samples a second um, we can sustain two million samples a second so why are you doing it at that level as opposed to doing it something like uh, pulling the rebel and dapple um, registers off of, off of like the processors or whatever so we're looking at the whole processor we're not so we're, so we're taking it's, it's a resistor shunt across the power supply to the processor core right. okay so we're not relying on any particular process a particular internal architecture and in particular we don't want to do anything to the processor like reading a register that may itself affect energy consumption okay and at this level of sampling bear in mind that we tend to work in the deeply embedded space for quite a few of the processes we're at the stage where we can just about measure the energy consumption of a single instruction so that's the board and the, you can see the first one of those running there's a little video on the wiki so the third thing that's new is at the risk of being howled down here we're not just doing GCC we're doing LLVM as well one of, yeah, <laughs> one of the one of the actual drawbacks of milepost was it was deeply integrated into GCC in fact it was deeply integrated into one version of GCC using a plug-in model that actually ended up not being the plug-in model that was adopted for GCC so there is milepost GCC 4.4 there is we did some work and made milepost GCC 4.5 but it's several hundred thousand lines of patches it's completely impossible when we get to the design discussion Simon will talk you through how we've got the objective of actually trying to make this much more compiler independent that will mean it can roll forward with new versions of GCC it also means we can work with other compilers and lastly this is industrial research funded by the government um, and they do expect results to deliver and so we're not tasked with doing some fancy research that's what universities and academic research grants are for this is industrial research grant we have to deliver actually a working system so I hope to come back next year it's an 18 month project we won't quite have finished by then and actually not just talk about the great research we've done but show off actually a piece of software that you can download and you guys can all try as well that's the overview part of it um, we've only been going for six weeks the project started on the 1st of June okay we've got some ideas and we've started to get the first shape of how we're going to put it together Simon's now going to present that um, but he's only got about three slides because the idea is to talk to those slides and have some discussion so the more if you think there's something we should be doing better way you've got a good idea how we should do it put your hand up and tell us okay there'll be a brief hiatus while I transfer the microphone
Right, well, um, in order to do this, we are essentially going to um, start off by re-implementing the same kind of ideas as my old post, um, by which we train off the set, off the set of existing um, optimizations within in GCC and LLVM to basically, the aim is you give this program that's, uh, you give GCC running a plugin, your program, it will go and say, okay, your program, <coughs> your program looks like this, you need to run optimizations X, Y, Z, and should everything work, hey, you've saved energy. Um, additionally to this, because, um, for those that were in James's talk earlier, James pointed out, um, all optimizations to date optimize for speed, you know, because you go fast, you save energy, but you can do better. So as part of this, we're also going to get Jörn Renneker to, um, based on research we're doing here and other research in Bristol, to try and write some optimization passes that won't necessarily make your code faster, it might be the same speed, but should reduce the amount of energy. Now, the, the, the overall aim is to try and avoid having anything, really, compiler-specific. So this dashed box on the right-hand side will tr try to contain all the logic to make everything work. Um, so you you run your program and information is passed from the compiler to something which makes it suitable for selecting passes and then you execute those passes. On a more detailed level, you start off running, um, your, compil running your compiler and there's an initialize there will be an, init init there. an initialization stage that will go okay, I'm running GCC 4.8 and I'm targeting this ARM architecture and so we will train um, for each different architecture because um, again, those who are in James's talk, these optimizations that work for say ARM won't necessarily be the best optimi optimizations to run for x86 so it'll be useful to produce a set of passes suitable for that. Then there will be a stage of generating some data from um, about your program which the uh, machine learner can learn about. So it may be how long your program is and how much, how, um, how much arithmetic's done. Um, those kind of things which then get passed through um, the center column which we're calling the coordinator which basically makes sure that everything's abstract where the dashed lines are going down we just have um, defined interfaces so that regardless of what your compiler is as long as you can say give us how many basic blocks there are in each function and give us a way to overtake the pass manager then everything else you don't have to touch and it all should just work fine. Um, based on the machine learning algorithm we will decide optimization passes which then get run. Um, we then generate some new, some either pull some statistics of this is what these passes did or we do the same step again and pass that over and this central loop can run as many times as you want. What, we're invi um, what we think may be a way forward is if the machine learner can say try running these optimizations you might save this much energy is have some sort of threshold that okay maybe it's not worth spending forever and a day compiling my piece of code we've gone far enough and then eventually things just come to an end. Um, one big challenge that we um, foresee is one thing we want to try and add is 
the ability to also change the order in which passes go. So one big um, part of the training setup for this will be um, teaching the system what makes sense to do, um, what, what orders of passes are valid, which may possibly be done with trying a bunch of options and seeing what crashes and going, that's bad, maybe we should avoid those. Um, again, in terms of um, the optimization passes that we run, um, all optimizations today optimize for speed. We've said that coming in the next year and a half, you may see some patches that add possibly a more useful name than dash F energy, but But yes. 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 I think. Uh, yes. I think one of the things, absolutely, the, the idea of having minus OE, it, it looks like we're thinking of writing one pass dedicated to energy. The idea is actually that we'll get Jörn Renica to write as many passes as he can according to the information that we've gleaned. So there's a thread of this project going on, which is. Uh, on the more academic side, which is learning as much as we can that's coming out from the analysis we're doing about what it is that makes a difference. So there are suggestions about uh, using planning distance when deciding uh, what ordering of instructions to minimize the number of bits being flipped. There are suggestions that in deeply embedded systems, you want to keep your inner loops in a single row of the flash so that you don't light up two rows of flash memory. Now those are two very good optimizations and they are separate optimizations, so we expect to have multiple energy or specific optimization losses. So one thing that you guys might want to be aware of is you're not the only people that are interested in energy and power. Um, the high performance computing uh, world is extremely interested yeah. in this topic right now. And um, you guys probably want to get in touch with Barry Roundtree at Lawrence Livermore. Um, and I don't have his email right, right immediately handy, but you can send me an email and I'll get you, get you to him. Um, the, the big thing is um, they're, they're approaching things from an um, algorithmic point of view, looking at uh, analyzing it, but they're instead of sampling at the board level, they're actually pulling it out of the. There, <coughs> there's registers that most of the vendors already put inside the processors that actually surprisingly well represent the number of nanojoules they use um, for for certain things. They use these um, to design the chips and to. Uh, um, and like on the Intel processors, they're like the REPL and the DAPL at um, things. And they use these to design the chips um, <coughs> and optimize their microcode and stuff like that. So these are, these are what you basically read a register. It's sort of like a timestamp counter um, for time, but it's more of a power utilization counter as you execute through like a critical section of a loop. You read before and after, go, oh, it took that much. OK, let's try this. So that might be, I don't know specifically about the processors that you're looking at, but you may want to look in there. They're not often documented, but if you talk to the, the original designers, um, there's, there are things that you can read, and that might allow you much finer grained control. Yeah, that, that, thanks for that, and I'll follow up. Yeah. Okay. The one thing we're very conscious of, and the reason the UK government's uh, putting quite a large sum of money is is precisely because so many people are working on this area. It's interesting, in the UK, they've actually defined that, that, that funding, they split into two. There's, because they, they, there seems to be a different set of requirements from the people who are worried about my, uh, my, my huge uh, data store is burning too many gigawatts, down to the people we're more concerned is that I'm using too many nanojoules. And they've actually separated out the nanojoules projects from the gigawatts projects um, for different approaches. So the, the big thing that we're, as we're pushing in the US government, pushing towards um, um, exascale, um, we're, we could build an exascale computer tomorrow. 
we would just have to co-locate it with the nuclear power plant. And that's no longer acceptable. Um, and so um, what they're discovering is um, they're going to have a power budget of around 20 megawatts. And so all of this stuff is learning how to, and that's about a factor of 10 away from where we are right now. Um, so what we need to do is we, learn, we need to learn how to, um, we need to make some very quantum jumps in the performance of these things to make it, uh, to be able to get it into the, the reasonable power range. And that, that includes construction set optimizations. So, so I'm actually personally involved in quite some of those DOE projects trying to optimize the energy. We're trying to do like a combine the hardware and software <coughs> optimization. Like for hardware, the traditional way is to change the voltage and the frequency of the, your processor depending on the requirements of your application. And sometimes you want slower executing, sometimes faster. And also then we want to try to turn on and turn off for some maybe function units. We are doing some simulator to try to uh, research into the simulation. And at the cache level, we are doing some kind of software to manage the cache coherency. Because if you can have like thousands of cores, the cache coherency can be extremely hard and consuming. Right. So we are trying to use some software technology to like you uh, use, use compiler to insert like that. Uh, and some cache lines to be invalidated or light back instead yeah. of hardware supported. Uh, and one of the papers I read just um, three or four days ago um, was uh, about the hardware transactional memory and the lock elision actually decreases the, the, um, the amount of information going across the intra processor bus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that should give you, um, that's yeah. one way to reduce the, yeah. um, cash, the demands and cache coherency across the massive parallel. Yeah, so another aspect is that the, if you focus on like a sequential execution code, there's not that much room for you to play to save energy. You have to go like beyond one process, one thread. In that kind of parallel execution environment, you have more uh, choices like uh, for OpenP multi-threaded execution, then you have like a large uh, section of idle uh, threads, then you can turn to something there. And for the heterogeneous computing, you have CPU, GPU, and processor together, then how to minimize the data movements between them. That's a large, huge topic. And of course, in MPI kind of setting, you have message sending, receiving, mm -hmm. how to optimize communication and the data mapping. So that, there are lots of um, choices we are kind of experimenting right now. So it's kind of, if you just focus on sequential code, uh, existing optimization, I think uh, not that much improvements, you will say. You have to kind of think like that in the bigger context. Uh, yeah, so I, th I think, un understand that this is mm -hmm. all bigger context, so maybe I've got a set of smaller contexts. Right. And yeah. we're one of the smaller contexts. So we have Bristol University is one of the centers in the UK for this. Mm -hmm. And there are actually a whole slew of projects mm -hmm. there going on. So for example, the Entra project, which is about actually giving visualization to the end user of how much energy their software is using. Because the number of software engineers who program for speed is very large, the numbers who program for size is quite large, the numbers who program for low energy usage is vanishingly small. And the reason is, I can find out how fast my program goes, I can find out how small my program is, but I can't find out how much energy it's using easily. So there's a whole slew of projects, and you're quite right, there's a general feeling the higher you go up the, the layer, up to the application layer, you're going to say, well, this will only work at the level of the compiler, and it was deliberately constructed to ask the question of how much can we do and what with the compiler. But it's only one you use this in conjunction with tools uh, to, 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 to do all the other, the other bits. Of, and indeed, the other, one of the really interesting ones, as you say, is the changing the instruction set architecture to make an energy efficient instruction set. Architecture. Right. Yeah. The hardware lock collision seems to be a great one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great mm -hmm. one even for performance too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Just because you don't have to maintain the same level of coherence. Yeah. Okay. So, what um, Yes. Um, 
as, as part of this project, and because everyone knows open and free is brilliant, um, ev literally everything we do will be documented on the project website. Like, okay, maybe not the detail for what type of tea did Jeremy have this morning, but... Um, well, I think the, that's important, too. <laughs> or was it brewed in an energy-efficient well, manner, I, but... I, 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 yeah, yeah, you might be kidding, and then you'll go out and buy it. It was in the UK, they had the first camera, yeah. coffee camera. Yeah. Um, but yes, so in terms of, you know, everything from the design to, well, things that are made as they are made. Yeah. Um, thank you. Okay. Do you want to go back up a couple to your design? So, yeah. so on this, this is the... We're at an early stage here, and we see one of the challenges here is extracting, actually extracting the features um, in a way that is sensible and compiler neutral. Um, and the second challenge is going to be is controlling the pass manager in a in a way that doesn't get too built in to the compiler. So are you pulling this off the intermediate layer, like John Gimple? And that's the one part I don't get about this. Like where? Well, they don't everywhere. Everywhere. Any pass. Well, we well, could have we could have we could have this at you know multiple times 